You probably clicked on this video because you're holding one of these stocks or you're thinking about holding one of these stocks or perhaps you're holding both of these stocks as we are. So we decided to take a look at how these two firms compared. What they have in common is that they were two of the first CRISPR gene editing firms to go to the public markets alongside Editas. And when that happened, we took a spray and pray approach invested in all three. And today we want to take a step back and say, is that still where we want to be placing our bets? So what we started out by doing is putting together a universe of all gene editing stocks. We came up with a list of 27 and then we further refined that list down to five. Now, of these names you see here, Editas, we took a closer look at and dismissed. And the reasons for that can be found in our Editas presentation and accompanying research piece. As for Beam Therapeutics, we found them to be quite compelling. We've always been eyeballing that firm. So we replaced our holding in Editas with Beam Therapeutics. That then leaves us with three firms. You have Caribou, CRISPR, and Intellia. As for Caribou, we're not looking into them very much because right now we just want to make a decision, which is, should we be holding both Intellia and CRISPR? So when we evaluate these two firms, we thought it would be fun to evaluate them alongside each other. We want to consider things like this. So the strength of partners, have any of those partners bailed? the current status of their lead drug. And when we look at firms, we try to keep things very simple and say, all right, they're hanging their hat on a single lead drug. Although maybe you could argue two lead drugs in the case of Intellia, but they're hanging their hat on this lead drug. And if anything goes pear-shaped with that, it doesn't bode well for the rest of their pipeline. So we like to see clear indications of progress. And that's what we're gonna talk about today. And then we were interested to see if there's any overlap between the two drug pipelines. So are these two firms working on the same thing? So if we start by looking at key partners for all three of the original gene editing stocks, you have Intellia with Novartis and Regeneron. They're currently working with both those firms still. You have Editas, which was working with a number of constituents, but the one that we noted was they're falling out with uh, ABV as a result of the, let's say, prior to the results of their lead candidate being released. So we cover that more extensively in the Editas piece. And then there's CRISPR. And this first relationship with Bayer, that didn't progress. So they created this joint venture and they went to fund it with something like $300 million. It was called Casabia Therapeutics. And then Bayer backed out and gave full ownership over to CRISPR Therapeutics. That's not good when a firm like the size of Bayer does that. So who would see that as a red flag? But on the other hand, you have this relationship with Vertex that's going quite well. And that's what we want to talk about today. So the lead candidate for CRISPR Therapeutics, and you can pretty much dismiss the, at least we do, the other candidates that they're working on in-house were mainly interested in the one that seems to be making a lot of progress. So it's this CTX001. It's a gene editing treatment for patients suffering from beta thalassemia and sickle cell disease. And the results of this so far are pretty remarkable. So we took this first statement from a biopharma dive uh, article that we featured in our research piece that did haul the heavy lifting for us, frankly. And they summarized it very well by saying they've treated 75 patients and nearly all of them are now living without the most serious and impactful effects of their illnesses. So you could say that they've been cured. And these two second bullet points here kind of describe what's happening for the two cohorts of patients, one being sickle cell patients, the other being patients with beta thalassemia. So in the former case, these are individuals that have what are called severe vaso-occlusive crises annually. We don't even know what that means, but we know they had four bad things happen a year. And in the other cohort, they would need to go in and get blood transfusions. That's pretty inconvenient. And since both cohorts were infused with Exocel, that's the lead candidate from CRISPR, the result are none of the sickle cell patients have reported any crises, that's great, 
and all but two of the beta thalassemia patients have stopped transfusions. Wow. And then in the, the two that it didn't, their transfusions decreased by at least 75%. That seems to be pretty successful outcome. And then the next thing you need to ask is, well, how long has this have these positive results been seen for? But we'll get to that in a little bit later. So there are, of course, some not so goods that were noted. The first is that several patients had serious adverse effects, but those have since been resolved. Uh, the procedure is very complicated. So they take out bone marrow and then they manipulate it and then they need to use chemotherapy to free up space in the bone to put in the bone marrow back. It's all rather complicated. And then the pharmaceutical company changed up the language a bit around how they measure treatment success. That could mean any number of things, but it was noted by the individual that wrote the excellent piece. And they concluded by saying that both firms are expected to ask or say hope to ask for approval in the United States, uh, let's say UK and Europe before the end of the year. So that's Vertex working with CRISPR on this therapy. If approved, it would become the first marketed medicine based on CRISPR. So that would be exciting. If we know we talk about a winner, is a winner the company that puts out the first drug? Perhaps you could say that if you use that as a criteria, but when it comes to investing, there's a different set of criteria and we'll talk about that. So that's CRISPR and you know, by all means, they're making great progress. Then we have Intellia. Now for Intellia, we should probably consider two lead candidates from these two big pharma companies they're working with. The first would be ex vivo, so outside the body therapy for sickle cell disease. Sound familiar? Well, that's similar to what CRISPR is doing. And then there's this in vivo inside the body treatment, which is a injection being developed with Regeneron. And that's mainly what we're interested in. So the Novartis uh, effort, they're currently enrolling patients for a proof of concept study. They're expected to follow the patients for two years. That's happening now. Well, contrast that to CRISPR. Read this statement. So this was made in November of 2019. CRISPR said this. Nine months after receiving an infusion of gene edited stem cells, a patient in a closely followed clinical study is free from the blood transfusions. Let's assume that they're still following that patient. That's a long time following that patient. So at least four years of data on a single patient that CRISPR has versus Novartis currently enrolling patients. So it seems like they're behind the ball. I'm sure they certainly know what they're doing, but at any rate, we wanted to focus on the work that Regeneron is doing, and this is around a disease, um, ATTR amyloidosis or something to that effect. And the point is it's rare, progressive, and in fatal. So what happens is that this protein starts folding incorrectly in the body. Well, there's a subset of individuals, somewhere around 50,000 people around the globe, it's not very many, that have this genetically, but there's also an additional two to 500,000 people where this disease suddenly just happens spontaneously. So Regeneron and Intellia plan to address both those cohorts, the genetic cohort and the people who just suddenly develop this problem. And the treatment's gonna use a non-viral lipid nanoparticle to knock out a gene in the liver. It's a single injection treatment. So how well has this worked? Well, these charts are very accessible. You can see along the bottom here, the milligrams that are given per kilo. So they consider how much the person weighs and then they give them an appropriate dosage. Well, as you move to the right, you can see that when they're dealing with these people, the N is the number of people. So you know, N equals three, there was three people. They gave them a much higher dose per kilo and it increases, you can see over to the right until you have a cohort of six people on the far right there who received the maximum dosage, let's see, at least for the study, right? And this was by day 28. What was the reduction in this bad TTR protein? Well, pretty significant. So it starts out when you give them just a small bit of the medicine, you know, half of it goes away. But when you give them a good dose of medicine, 93% reduction. And this other chart here is pretty accessible and pretty interesting. So you can see here that they're measuring, if you're able to, to note the little bars and lines that accompany each dot, that shows the range, right? 
So you can see that the range is quite dramatic for the low dosage, but as you increase dosage, range decreases. That means the volatility and the outcome decreases. That's great, right? Now, of course, also on the very bottom, you can see here the number of months, and we certainly need to wait over time to see how that progresses. Looks like, you know, after eight months, things are still the same. So how long do you wait? Well, it's that's difficult to say. Wait as long as you think you need to for the regulators to approve your drug, perhaps. So some some great, let's say great outcome, I suppose, for Intellia uh, so far in this treatment. Um, the other thing that we noticed for Intellia, and it's in an, another great article by Bi Biopharma Dive. They pick out great, great topics and really do, do them justice. And they talked about how Intellia is also strategizing around the aspects of this treatment based on other competing therapies out there. And you can read the piece. It's in our research piece, the link to that. And, you know, there's some complexity there. So I guess to summarize would be that CRISPR and Intellia are making great progress. But when we talk about picking a winner, I wanted to touch on this because, you know, we'll do an article like Palantir versus C3 and picking a winner. And somebody will say, well, you know, time will tell whether or not you picked the right stock. And you need to actually be a little bit more careful when you talk about investments that way. So first of all, you need to consider what, not when somebody purchased their shares or made that decision, what's their cost basis, right? So if you're dollar cost averaging, buying over time, it's not a binary event. It happens over time. When you exited is the same fashion. How much alpha you captured, you know, let's say we don't exit in a single day at a single point in time. It, similar to dollar cost averaging, we exit over multiple times and spread it out. This is all to avoid market timing risk. Then you need to look at the alternative. When you exit the stock that you chose in the other firm, would you have exited that position at the same time for the same reasons? Definitely not. So there's an exit associated with that. You may or may not make the right choice. And that, so, you know, you can compare those two uh, outcomes, but it's very difficult to try to make assumptions around that. And what it all comes down to is this for any position. What did the benchmark do? So when you invest in one stock, you don't compare that outcome to another stock. You compare it to a benchmark, and that tells how good of an investor you are. So we talk about picking a winner, you know, and sometimes it's very clear, right? So if CRISPR, CRISPR goes out in a puff of smoke tomorrow, then, you know, they were clearly a loser, but it's rarely that clear. So I just wanted to touch on this whole notion of picking a winner. Now, when we go back to revisiting the two stocks we talked about today, CRISPR, the cons, Bayer bailed on them. They have one leading candidate and little else, at least from our perspective. And the pros are they've more or less cured 75 people of two deadly diseases so far. And then you have Intellia. They've tested a much smaller population so far for their lead candidate that we'd be focusing on. Uh, it's also competing against other treatments, but the pros are they have two very large partners for their two lead candidates. And they also have a base editing approach. That was something we noted, and it's hard to say how much action that's getting given all the work they're doing, but it was uh, worth noting that, especially for investors in beam therapeutics. Now, the last thing we wanted to look at for both firms is this notion of runway, which is simply the amount of cash they have on hand versus what they're burning. And these are very difficult estimates to calculate when you're looking at pharmaceutical firms that are very volatile and uh, things can change from quarter to quarter. But last quarter, Intellia burnt through 147 million. They have a, a 750 in cash on hand. It's about a year and a quarter runway. CRISPR, 175 million, 179 million burned last quarter. Gives them a runway of about two years, given the 1.6 billion of cash they have. But these firms, you know, when they go to raise, it's going to be a lot more difficult and they'll probably look to raise around good news. So we had made the comment in our research piece that no good, no news was good news, but that's not necessarily true because if you never hear any news, that's bad news. So it, again, these are very, you can almost feel the risk when you look at these companies, how complex they are, how complex the technology is, how much regulatory risk they're having to deal with, how much uncertainty there is. So to conclude, both firms are certainly making progress. Uh, the interpretation of those results 
will increase volatility. I'll give you an example that was it CRISPR that had their recent, um, they had a recent innovation day and boy, the, you would have thought they were clubbing baby seals to death on Twitter. Everybody was just condemning them. Uh, and, and then other people are saying, no, it's not so bad. And then you had analysts, one analyst set a price target, which price targets are largely useless at $60. The other was at 120. We all have access to the same information, but we all interpret it differently. And that increases volatility. So tracking progress for either of these firms will be very difficult. But what we want to watch very closely is what their key partners say and do, because that telegraphs a lot about the progress they're making. So please leave your comments in the comments section. Make sure to subscribe to our channel. Thanks so much for taking the time to watch this video today.